Minds on Muscle community, welcome to the Fitness Pro Mentors interview series. If you want to hear some amazing interviews from amazing fitness professionals all over the world, please join our Fitness Pro Mentors private Facebook group. But today, let's make it rain. Hey everyone, welcome to the Fitness Pro Mentors podcast. I am interviewing exercise titans from all over the world who are superstars doing exactly what you do, using exercise to help change lives. But these people have been doing it for a while and I would say they are titans. Today I've got a titan that loves dead bodies and helping superstar people, Mr. Joe DeAntonis. Joe, how you doing, man? I'm great, man. How you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I have spent a lot of time with you. You and I have eaten some gigantic hamburgers together. We've oh yeah, some counter. That's some counter yeah. to be exact. How big was the hamburger? How big were those hamburgers? Three pounds Dude. of ground beef. I thought that it was going to be doable. I totally thought we'd be able to do it. And it's just like it was torture around. Like you know, you get thirty three percent through, and it's like no go. Yeah, it, it was if they were, if they cooked it so dry though, it, it, you had to drink like two gallons of water just to get half of it down. It was like yeah, it was it was a process though. So I, I'm really excited to interview you and have people learn a little bit more about you. I was like thinking, like ruminating on it. You know, I remember hearing about you when I first got into the RTS world, that you were doing all this cadaver stuff, that you were an incredible instructor. And I never really met you until I came to Pittsburgh and did some of your cadaver labs. And then, you know, modifying some of the time, unfortunately, we lost a good friend of ours, Peter, which brought you to my town to teach RTS so I could learn how to become an instructor, which kind of turned you into like, honestly, one of my main educational mentors at the very beginning. And it sounds like you being a mentor to a lot of people, either directly, indirectly, is not something that's uncommon. You have been silently for decades, I would say, influencing people and helping people crush it. So, Joe, what's your secret, man? <laughs> well, it, it's, it's really funny because, you know, when I got into this field, it, this wasn't my original field, right? So I, I just had a, a big passion for it. it. It was something I'd always done. I'd always, I was always an athlete. Um, I was always, you know, trying to get involved in exercise somehow. It helped my friends put workout programs together and everything. And I think it's, it really comes down to the passion. And, and I just I love what I do and I love what I'm doing and I love to teach. And I, I think it just it might, I guess it shows. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, Joe, I, if, for anyone who's listening and doesn't know you, uh, what was your original career and how did you get all the way over to personal training? Yeah, so uh, when I was in college, I studied, uh, well, so my first couple of years, my first like two and a half years in university were in engineering. And um, so I was looking at uh, mechanical engineering, which kind of fits, it kind of come full circle at some point, right? And um, I, I ended up getting, uh, going into some stuff, I went into criminology, and I, got, I double majored in criminology and psychology. And I worked in a federal prison for a while. I worked at a, a youth service center uh, counseling, you know, troubled kids. And um, and then when I moved to Pittsburgh, <clears throat> like, uh, let's see, that was in 96, I moved to Pittsburgh and the, the government was on a hiring freeze. So I was looking for jobs in like the, the crime lab and things like that, or I do, yeah, you because know, I had done some forensic studies and uh, in my criminology work. And so then they, they weren't hiring, they were on hiring freeze. So I ended up getting, I had gotten certified as a personal trainer in college. So like in 93, 94, I got certified as a personal trainer. And so I saw a personal training job, picked it up and loved it. And I used to train boxers when I was in, in college. I worked at a boxing gym. I was a competitive fighter myself. And so I started training boxers and then I moved to Pittsburgh and I got doing general fitness. And, uh, and then just loved it. And at that point decided I better start educating myself in this field now, because, you know, this seems like where I'm going to stay. And, uh, so I ended up just running with it and I ended up getting a master's in exercise science and I uh, did some sports medicine, uh, you know, coursework at university of Pittsburgh and, and, you know, of course then ended up going through the RTS and muscle activation programs and yeah, just blew it up. Well, man, I mean, that's such a massive pivot. I mean, you're in school for engineering and then you did psych and criminal stuff and then you're working in a prison. Um, like, if you don't mind me asking, like engineering is an incredible field, lots of career opportunities and kind of along the lines of the mechanical thinking you have, what was it that made you go two years to engineering and you're like, you know what, I'm just not getting what I need here. Yeah, it was, it was interesting because I, <clears throat> so I was starting to get in some pretty tough classes where I was going to have to put a lot of time into it. And um, I, I think I was just too young in my brain to, to really commit to that, that much study education. So I kind of switched fields. And it was also something I was interested in. You know, I've, you know, I've been around, you know, 
guns and whatever, all like grew up in West Virginia hunting and fishing stuff. So, you know, that, that and I had uh, some friends that were, uh, you know, police officers and things like that. So, you know, it was kind of that became like a kind of a cool little piece to it. But again, I gravitated towards the forensic part of it, right, which was all the physics. And I was looking at like um, so my specialty in the criminology field was in the blood splatters and and the forensic investigation side of it. Right. So it all kind of came. It was still the physics stuff. And that was appealing to me. And and I, so I kind of went with that route. And then when I did the psychology part, I was doing the, you know, uh, abnormal psychology and the psychology of white collar crime and, it, you know, things like that. They were like just specialty, you know crime related or, you know, uh, you know, we did, uh, what was the one was uh, serial killers was a whole class on serial killers and, you know, so it's like weird stuff like that. But, but, um, but it was like, it was like the, the putting the pieces together, um, you know, just like, you know, so like in engineering, right. You, you're, you're studying the physics and, and the, the math and the mechanics and all that kind of stuff. And then you, you know, you put things together to make them work right. Right. And that was kind of what I was doing in the so, you know, kind of because I've explored this with you. It's like, why the heck did it, what made me switch into this? Right. And, and it was the same thing. I was looking at the, the math and the science. I'm looking at trajectories of, of fluid splatters and and then, you know, what you know, how, how to put the scene together into something that made sense, you know, but, you know, mechanically or just, you know, functionally. Right. So it's, it's kind of doing the same thing. And then when I started getting into. So in 2003 was the first cadaver workshop I taught. And because um, I'd been studying cadaver anatomy for several years before that, but it was the same thing. I felt like, you know, I'm starting doing cadavers and I'm looking at, OK, well, you know, and, and Tom, you know, Purvis with, with RTS kind of started that thought process in me in, in 99, 2000, where, you know, OK, why is the bone shape like that? And how do these two fit together and how they move on each other? And why is the muscle angled this way? And, you know, so then I started looking at all that stuff and how to put it together from a you know, mechanical standpoint. So. so we got to talk about the cadaver stuff, but there's a leap that happened there because you went into the personal training stuff and you're like, I got to educate yeah. yourself more. Then you went to the, the traditional master's route. And then from there, you went on, you took these like private education, like RTS and MAT programs, which I know at that time for both those programs, if there's been some evolution, were very engineering and thought provoking. And I was just wondering, like with all of the engineering criminology psych education you had the personal training education you had how much of that engineering background you had was already in the personal training world versus after when you had that introduction to those programs that tom purvis taught well so what's really interesting is so i actually did uh before i went to graduate school in the exercise science field i did rts and and what was kind of cool was yeah so i ended up you know and, and what, what what drove me towards that was I went to an idea present or an idea conference and Tom was presenting there and I went to one of his workshops. And he was talking about physics and, you know, moment arms and, all, and stuff that I was familiar with. And I was like, wait a minute, this is that's why that feels that way when you do this exercise. And, and I hadn't had that explained to me before in the exercise world, like nobody was looking at that kind of stuff. Right. So so as soon as I saw one of his workshops, I was like, I have to learn more about what this guy does. And so that's when I just embedded myself in RTS. And then, you know, I, I came, came home and I was like, you know, man, I, I got to go to Oklahoma. <laughs> I got to get, I got to get the full picture. Right. So then I ended up going down there and I wasn't even done with the program yet. It was, it was kind of, it was kind of exciting for me because I was in my, I was finishing up the second to last mastery course down in Oklahoma. And, um, and no, it was, I was in my, it was in my last one and he always made you teach something at it. And so he, he has, Tom asked me, he goes, well, do you want to do your teaching part in this one? So you don't have to come back for the next one. Cause he goes, and I was like, what? <laughs> so, like he asked, asked me ahead of time. I was just like, Oh no. You know, like, so I was like, well, sure. Why not? And I did it and, and nailed it. But, but he, he was like, you know, I see you doing it. Like I'd be in the background. Somebody was confused with what he was saying and he'd see me take them off to the side and show them some other example. that wasn't maybe one that he didn't even show or whatever. And was just kind of like, this guy's already, he's already on the right track. And, and it was because it, it was that, I think that engineering background, just my brain works that way, that the mechanics uh, of all the exercise stuff kind of, it just flowed with me, you know? 
Yeah. Well, you, I think you must, from all the boxing stuff and the engineering and just your kind of visual creative mind, I think you must have been able to connect it differently. Because I've talked to engineers who have like the full degree, the full gamut, and they still have they have still have a hard time kind of seeing it in that kind of three dimensional dynamic way. Um, so I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, every time I talk to you, even now, I mean, you're building new things and designing new things to help create new opportunities for your clients and yourself. And I just think it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, no, it's it's fun. And, and for me, I, I just have that. I don't know. My brain's always spinning. So it's always it's always always looking for the next new thing that, you know, next new gadget that we can manipulate and help challenge you know, body in different positions or whatever it is, you know. Which speaking of that, I just remembered on that exact note, this magnetic friend that you were working on. Any updates yes. there? Yeah, unfortunately right now, no. It, it, I, it's, it's, still, it's still on the back burner right now. Um, we've, had, uh, we've had some, we, I've gone through probably about six different people who have started the project and haven't been able to finish. So I, I'm kind of, yeah, it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit touchy with me, right? <laughs> Fair enough. So all I'll say that anyway, that's listening to this in the future, Joe is working on something for anatomy learning that will blow your mind. It'll be the exact tool you'll need if you're trying to study mechanics, but that's all we'll say on that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, we, I have a, I also have another device is we've got a, like a pull-up assist that we're working on right now. And, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty beast. And, and uh, it, again, same thing. I've had three different people work on it and it's still not, it's still in prototype session but it's it's yeah it's good though but we have a couple other projects coming up too so <laughs> we've got a lot going on right now. it's Dude, exciting well, you've always got a lot going on and that gets it's just exciting to see someone as you as excited and passionate about all this mechanical stuff and then constantly will be pushing the paradigm so to speak to give more back to trainers and other people it's, it's amazing yeah yeah so speaking of people That's who are cool. inspired by you uh lucy is here you know good you know good old lucy ben burrito yeah Broski. of course Actually, Lucy's coming to start here work at Strata. Super excited about that. Oh, yeah, That's yeah. Awesome. I'm super stoked about that. Lucky Hi, Lucy. Lucky um, <laughs> so I got a question for you. What the fascia? I've learned so much. <laughs> so honestly, your cadaver stuff, you are, I would say, the first introduction to cadavers and dead bodies and this idea of a personal trainer really learning more about what's going on beneath the skin. The idea is that different joint systems and are very different shape from one body to another, and that some bodies might even have different muscular attachments and new muscles in some cases from another body to another. How did you even get into that and decide that, hey, this is something that personal trainers, exercise pros need to learn more about? Yeah, so I, when I, uh, you know, obviously when I went through RTS, um, we were exposed to cadaver through, um, through the mastery program there in Oklahoma at Oklahoma State University. And at the time I was working at Allegheny General Hospital and the orthopedic, so I, I ran the employee wellness center at um, Allegheny General Hospital. And so the, so you, know, you look at the orthopedic surgery residents, right? These guys, they're, they're like the meatheads of the, of the medical world. Right. And, um, you know, typically they, a lot of times they're athletes and, you know, they come in and they're, they're doing their, their workouts or whatever. And I would watch them work out and I'm looking at them like, what, what's this guy doing? Why is he doing it that way? So I would talk to them about that. So I would, t you know, would talk to them about joint mechanics and w why doing it that way might not be ideal. You might want to modify it to this. And they were like, holy cow. <clears throat> and that, they're like, that makes so much sense. And, you know, these guys are physicians, you know, you're like, what? You're like I, I thought you would know this, you know, and at that time I was thinking, oh, these guys all know this stuff. They, you know, this isn't new to them, but then you would watch them. Well, come to find out it, it was very new to them. Well, they, when the new residents came in every year, they would do cadaver workshops. So they started inviting me to those. So for like eight years, um, they invited me to these, uh, these cadaver workshops that they would do. Um, they would do once a week for the first eight weeks of every new resident round. So like every year. And um, by the end, I was teaching muscle mechanics to the orthopedic surgery residents. And, the, you know, the, all the preceptors were kind of like, you know, looking in like, what the heck? You know, what's this guy teaching? You know? And um, so, you yeah, know, that got me really excited about it. And then I started I had student interns at my facility. So I started taking them into the cadaver lab. I, I asked, the, you know, I got approval from orthopedic surgery guys. And, hey, can I take my students and teach them some anatomy? And they're like, yeah, sure. 
And then they wanted to start coming to my thing. <laughs> and I was like, well, that's kind of cool. And so, um, so uh, I started doing that. And even then, so we had a lot of medical students there. So I started taking some medical students up into the, into the lab. And then it just kind of evolved into the, and then when I, when I started with the muscle activation uh, internship, uh, I invited my class that I was in with to come to Pittsburgh and do a cadaver anatomy. And that was like the first real group class that I taught other than like one or two people or whatever. And, um, and so uh, my whole, or when I say the whole class, but a good, good portion of my MAT internship class came and we did a anatomy workshop and that kind of just spawned the whole thing. And, uh, and then, and from that point on, it just be, you know, I started doing all the dissections myself and I'd spend hours and hours dissecting. And then, then people would come in and they'd be like, well, what did it look like before this? And, what, and I was like, oh, well, I guess we could do a dissection workshop. So then we started doing the dissection workshops, right? So I just get a new specimen and, you know, we would go from first cut and just, you know, go layer by layer through all the little fascial layers and, and how everything's connected. And, and then you get this really phenomenal picture of how everything is so connected. Every portion of the body is connected to, you know, I mean, they're all, everything's, <laughs> and, but then you get the, the picture of how they're connected because you're going through layer by layer of each fascial layer, each, each muscle fascia, you know, connective tissue layers. And, and you see what connects to what and how it can tug on, you know, what, what creates these tissue chains, you know, or these uh, mechanical chains that are, that are really existent in the body, you know? And, and, and so when we start looking at, you know, this tissue tugging on that one, Bam, you know, and all of a sudden it's like it opens your eyes to, you know, how, how well interconnected everything really is. It's insane. And I think it's such an honorable thing. Like, I mean, honestly, when I think of what really kind of helped shift my paradigm, I mean, RTS was a massive paradigm shifting program for me, thought process wise. Coming to Pittsburgh, I think I came three times, uh, two classes. And then the third one, the second one we actually did was the full body thing, like the three and a half days. We had a fresh specimen and went right in. And all of that was changed my perspective over and over and over again. I mean, the idea that there is absolutely no such thing as muscle isolation. You can say that you can look at the books and you get it. But when you see like it is like five layers of hamburger sewn together with different lines, yeah. you just there's no way around it. Like you have to recognize this is not a pec exercise. This is everything on the front exercise. <laughs> and you got to respect yeah. that, you know, um, yeah. I got to tell yeah. you that class that three and a half day one class. Actually, the first time I came out there, I think you invited me the evening before the actual class to help get th things set up. And it was my first time mm -hmm. being around a dead body. And I'll never forget the smell. And then when we left the room, I'll never forget the taste because you and I went to like a little Italian diner thing, like across the street. And all I oh, wanted yeah, to like get was, well, yeah, all I wanted to get was ice cream because I didn't want to get any meat or pasta because all I could taste was like meat and pasta. Like, this is just awful. I don't know how you do it all the time. Oh, man, I had a student. Uh, I taught a workshop. It was probably in uh, early 2000s, like maybe 2004 or five or something like that. And I saw her like, I don't know, six, seven years later or something like that. And she was like, I still haven't eaten meat since that class. <laughs> and I said, oh, man. I said, I had, I had steak that night. Uh, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, but you're, used to, you're used to it. it it's funny because the smell, that we're very lucky in our lab, though, the, the chemicals they use, they use a very low percentage of formaldehyde because formaldehyde is a, the, it's the best preservative that we have. I mean, it's, it, just, it just is. But it, it's really offensive with the smell and everything. And I'm... I'm Lucky enough that the specimens that we use have a really low percentage of formaldehyde and they have some other really good chemicals that aren't as, as offensive smell wise. So they don't, you know, they don't, yeah, a lot of people, because the, um, I've been in the labs before where you walk in and the second you walk in, your eyes start watering and, and the, when you leave, it's, you got this throbbing headache and I mean, it's crazy. And, um, but yeah, like we're lucky enough that we, we have specimens and, and the, now the new lab, and I don't think you've been, you were in the old lab that was pretty small, right? Yeah. The new lab is insane. It's like they did like a $5 million renovation, moved oh. it to a different part of the hospital. It's massive. And it's got, they've got these cameras set up so that you can, um, you can zoom the camera in on certain parts and it'll put it up on a big screen what? and stuff. It's crazy. And uh, I don't use that too much, but occasionally it's kind of cool to see that. So if there's a big group or whatever. And um, 
And uh, yeah, so it's some really cool stuff, but it's all, I, I think the best part is the hands-on, you know, you, you get your hands in there and, and we've, I've had people come and they, they don't, they don't necessarily touch anything, they, but you can still get pretty close and look and see things and watch other people move it and still get a pretty good feel for it. But, but I think just getting your hands on and seeing the tension in the tissues and that kind of stuff is, it's huge. And, uh, you know, seeing the thickness of the skin layers and, and just stuff like that, it, it's wild because if you're doing any kind of palpation type techniques or any kind of manual therapy techniques, I mean, it's just neat to see, you know, what's underneath where I'm pushing, you know, like what I'm pushing on something or I'm doing something, you know, what's underneath that. Yeah, I remember you were saying that you had a majority of uh, massage students that you'd actually have come in through the program. And I'm sure for them, that was like eye screechingly, oh, like must have blistered their eyes right open because frankly, it's such a big difference than, hey, you're rubbing pectoralis major. When you see like how huge it is or small it is and what's on top and beneath it, I mean, it must just blow their mind. I mean, in your opinion, what would you say like the number one net takeaway that people get from doing that experience? Yeah, I mean, there's, I think we're different uh different people it's gonna be different things so like i have you know i have some uh, physical therapists that come through that have already had cadaver right but for them it, it becomes more of a because you know it's, it's just like in medical school and physical therapy school they take it so early on before they know anything about anything else right and then they take all this physiology and kinesiology and biomechanics and all these things and never go back to cadaver anatomy and and now the new pt programs are not even doing cadaver anatomy they, they've cut it from a lot of the programs. So, but, but what I would get before is they, they'd have this great background in mechanics that they, they got in PT school and they've already seen cadaver. So it's, there's not as much of a sticker shock, right? Because, you know, the first time you see it, you're kind of like, you know, deer in a headlights kind of thing. It's like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. This is like a real human body and it's kind of weird. And, and it's overwhelming to some extent where I don't think you absorb as much, but when you've done it, for a period of time already and then you get in it you get so much more out of it and so those pts they come out and and it's just they remember like oh my gosh this is really different than what i remembered it being and then now they they see it and they, and they they i think they get something very different than the, the massage therapists who are you know because pts are doing uh movement and and they looking at mechanics and stuff like that whereas massage therapists aren't always doing a lot of movement. I mean, sometimes they're doing some joint mobilizations type stuff or things like that. But a lot of times they're just doing, you know, uh, palpation, you know, trying to, you know, find where muscles are, like muscle bellies are to, to kind of release tension and that kind of stuff. And so they get a better idea of, you know, if, if you feel tension in an area, like how many layers of tissue were there really there? Is it, was it really the muscle you thought it was? Or was it something underneath it or, or superficial to it or, you know, whatever. And so they, they get that concept of the, the fascial layers and all the different layers of tissue. Uh, and, and they might not be able to be doing what they think they're doing, you know, Yeah, <laughs> which sure. is, I think is, yeah. Well, admittedly, I mean, I, I was definitely doing techniques that involve manual palpation at one time. And I would say that there were a few reasons why I stopped using that and focused purely on just muscle contractions to help with progressions. But I think one that was like, you know, eye stabbingly obvious was that I didn't I wasn't touching what I thought I was touching. And that when you start forgetting right. about muscle, even though I love talking about muscles, when you start putting your skin, your fingers into the sensory somatic system of the skin and you see all the different layers of just the skin and the tissue before the muscle, I mean, there are so many receptors that you're just blasting through. How cool would it be if you could come up with a more gentle contraction based system to actually start with someone right at square one and progress them to whatever type of movement they want to do? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So on that note, and, uh, you know, I, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, good, good. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, that idea, and I, and I, I, I kind of got that idea from you originally. I remember talking to you and Chris Graney in different instances talking about exploring range of motion, posture, and all these pieces that someone may come in with as a personal training client, and then starting with the idea of a contraction, but recognizing there are different types of contractions, and that if you can figure out contraction modes they need to focus on, how you can progress that to the gym floor. I mean, honestly, I never saw you talk do that technique and talk about how you work with people to progress people but the philosophy has been in my head ever since you mentioned it and if you mind i'd love to hear more about when you meet a fresh human a fresh human a fresh live human for you <laughs> how do you progress how do you progress a fresh live human from the initial introduction of meeting you uh down to the gym floor to whatever you like to do because you got a really unique space there at move integrated yeah yeah it's it's 
it's funny, you know, John, my business partner, John Phillip, has done a great job, you know, setting the place up and, and we've, you know, kind of made some modifications and we're in the process of doing some more right now. So it's, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's always a, a evolving, you know, facility, which is kind of fun. But yeah, so we, we have, uh, we have kind of a little system of stuff that, you know, we have like a pretty extensive intake form and we have, um, it, it's, it's not insane where, you know, you have to do, you know, a million things of paperwork before you get started with somebody, but it, it's, you know, it's enough where we can get a kind of a little bit of a picture of, you know, what kind of things they're having problems with. Yeah. Cause we have, we have a lot of people that come in just for, you know, uh, just improving fitness level and that kind of stuff. Right. So, um, John gets a lot more of those. I get a lot of the people that are, you know, kind of partially broken and, and trying to get, you know, back to more normal and, and then eventually get to, you know, to advanced movement kind of stuff. But, but, um, but we have a whole, a whole, mi you know, a whole mixed bag of, of who, who comes in and where they are, where in their starting point. But, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, range of motion obviously is a, is a big piece and, and, what types of things, you know, what, where they're having pain when they move. And, you know, we kind of explore some of the psychology of it too. So we have, there's some psychological pieces to our intake form and because there's so, you know, some people get attached to um, what's happening in their body, you know, so, you know, mentally, psychologically. So, you know, the, we have to understand if we're working through some of that too. And so, <clears throat> um, yeah, it, it, we, you know, we start with, you know, basic movement, and then uh, we do some, you know, some isometric contraction. Then we start moving into, you know, concentric, eccentric stuff. And then we start moving into loading and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, it, you know, a lot of it is is just movement based. And we start looking at daily movement patterns. We have some videos we've put together for people to do. Um, there's real specific daily movement patterns and just different isometrics to, you know, get you know, for your feet. And for we have a whole hand system that we work with, with fingers and, and oops. And like punching bags camera. of sand. Yeah, yeah, like oh, but yeah, like where you're doing like different uh, different things with your fingers and isometrics of those and you know all that. And so we have a whole thing with that. We have a whole thing with your feet and with your toes. And and we're actually creating a system. So like I, we've kind of uh, adopted. So we, we, I don't know if you're familiar with the Swedish gymnastic system, but it was it was a big thing back in the late 1800s. And we there's some pretty cool stuff that they did that that is. And there's a whole this whole concept of you know physical culture, right? So, and if you look at our name, it's you know move integrated physical culture, and we um, there's uh, this whole idea of of you know how everything you know from eating to uh, breathing to you know some kind of activity exercise type stuff you know are all part of your your health and well being, and so we try to incorporate all those things into our system. Uh, of you know getting someone healthier and um and so but the swedish gymnastics system was they they had some pretty cool progressions on how they did things so we've taken them modified it a little bit and gone from there and they had people back then in the late 1800s that they called mechanotherapists and so we've kind of adopted that term as what we do is as mechanotherapy uh, because it really matching what we're doing with people you know we're really looking at the mechanics and and it's very therapeutic whether it's you know emotionally or physically or whatever and um and so looking at, at that you know we, we have this whole mechanotherapy process we do and then we're in the process of creating a like kind of like a shortened version of it um with some isometrics and some other things for different parts of the body right so we can do like shortened pieces of it and i don't want to get too far into that because it's something we're going to be releasing as a, as a training program i think so it's it's pretty slick and it's a lot of stuff that we've we've been doing for a lot of years because i've been in it moved now since probably 2013 so it, we you know we've been kind of working together for quite a while on a lot of these things and tr a lot of trying different things out and uh you know exploring things what works with more people and and, and that kind of stuff and and so we've put this together and we're creating this system of uh, you know how to evaluate and and work on something on someone and get certain pe parts of their body working better you know well i'm excited to hear more about the the whole thing and honestly any any piece of information that comes from you and if john's working on it too he's an amazing marketer communicator he's super detail oriented i i love seeing all the stuff he does if you two together are working on something it's going to be amazing and any trainer listening to this will have to check out move integrated physical culture because you guys are just crushing it and making it rain i love it 
Yeah, yeah, it's the best. <laughs> so that brings me to how the heck did you meet John? And where I want to go with this is when I met when I first met you, I would say in my opinion, you were pretty nomadic in that you were had a lot of amazing stuff. You were an instructor for a few programs, but you really didn't have like a set home. You were working in a few different places. You had a great client base, but you were definitely like a uh, an exercise professional nomad floating around. And then now you've kind of settled with a business partner, which is awesome. Yep. And now you have this amazing place that I would say definitely resonates with some of your body views. How did that happen? Yeah, it was interesting. So he, uh, John was a trainer at a facility here in Pittsburgh and one of his colleagues, uh, ended up stumbling upon, uh, the muscle activation techniques program. And at that point, I was teaching for uh, MAT. And this was quite a while ago. And so he went through the Jumpstart programs with uh, one of the other instructors. And while he was in the program, he was talking to the instructor. And, and, and they're like, you know, where do you live? And they're like, he's like Pittsburgh. And, and th this kid is a great guy. And I don't know, you may have met him because he ended up going through things. Is uh, Kazutaka. All right. So, um, no. Yeah. Anyway, he, he was he was a Japanese exchange student here and he went to Slippery Rock University. And I used to teach uh, at Slippery Rock University. I would do like guest lecturing stuff up there. And um, so he was a student up there, graduated in exercise science at Slippery Rock. And, um, <clears throat> and then he found out that I was in Pittsburgh and, and then he started just kind of training under me. He would come to I was just when I was still working at Allegheny General Hospital and he would come like once a week. And then he was like, you got to meet this guy that's one of the trainers at my gym. His name's John Philip Yonan. You know, he's great. He's a really good thinker. And so we, he introduced us and we met a couple of times. And, and um, shortly thereafter, uh, John opened this place up here. And when he had his grand opening, I couldn't come to it because I was, I was, I think I was teaching an RTS course or something. You know, I was out of town. And at that time I was teaching, you know, every other weekend, I think I was teaching a workshop somewhere. And um, <clears throat> so I just never got a chance to make it down here. Then I was doing a, a, another workshop at a different facility in Pittsburgh and, and John came to it. And, uh, and it was like, Oh man, it's so good to see him. And, and I was like, man, how's your facility? He's like, Oh, it's great. You know, we're doing you know, this and that. So I was like, well, I got to come down and see it. So I, I came down and of course, again, like you said, I was, I was the nomad, man. I had, uh, you know, I was working out of five different places. I was working out of a chiropractic facility one day a week and, you know, one part of town and I was in another part of the town two days a week. And it was just, it's crazy, you know? And so when I, when I reconnected with John and like, it was probably like in uh, early 2013, I started coming down here and seeing people. And then I just kind of transitioned here at, uh, in 2013 and, and uh, like late 2013, I transitioned to coming here because it just kind of gave me a home base. And it was great because we just played off each other really well. We our personalities match great. And, and, um, you know, where he, he keeps me in check and, and I keep him in check and we, <laughs> it's good. Yeah. So on that note, and that, I mean, I love it. I mean, honestly, from everything I know about you, um, it looks like a perfect match for you. I mean, some of the kind of like the way you like to explore dynamic movement, your martial arts background, you know, the kind of barefoot, mm -hmm. raw, controlled martial arts and fitness together. I mean, it seems like a really, really cool marriage. Um, in most cases, Every time I've met people and they talk about business partnerships, they say, don't do it. Business partnerships are tough and there's always problems and one person does more work than the other and it's very turbulent. Now, I know of a few pairs that have really done it well. Johnny and Michelle come to mind. Brad and Sam Streich and Six seem to do it really, really well. Uh, how do you guys make it work? I mean, 2013, that's quite a long time to be invested both monetarily as well as time-wise in something. How do you guys make it work? Yeah, I think and part of it is, I mean, we're both pretty laid back. I mean, we're both pretty high intensity people, but we're also both pretty laid back in a lot of ways. Right. And um, I, I, we, we complement each other really well. And I, I think that's a huge piece of it. Like the things that um, <clears throat> like I, I'm I'm the kind of person that I don't want to release anything until everything's perfect. Right. Like it has to be 100 percent perfect or I don't want it to go out there. And he's ready to jump it out tomorrow. Like he wants it to go out tomorrow. And I'm like, well, wait, we can't do that. And he's like, well, we can't wait any longer. And, you know, so he kind of forces me to rush it a little bit. And I kind of force him to hold it back a little bit, you know, but it, but it works, you know. And <clears throat> but, there, you know, a lot of it, too, is, is we both see, I think, this bigger picture of where this can really go. 
And we know there's there's so much more that we can be doing and giving back to people. And, and that's kind of what we both want. You know, we 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 both really enjoy what we do and we, we like doing it, you know, at this level. But we also know that that there's a lot more people that could benefit if we change some things and, you know, started teaching people how to teach some of the stuff that we're doing and, and that kind of stuff. So that's kind of, I think that's always in the back of the mind. So we, and we know that we are really good at reeling each other in. So it's, it's easy. I mean, uh, to just kind of keep that all, uh, keep each other in check and just keep moving forward, knowing that there's this, this bigger thing coming, you know? And, um, uh, that's awesome. I mean, it yeah. sounds really good. That, I mean, the fact that you guys both have different ways that you like to approach business, but you have found this kind of like balance between the yin and the yang of the speed and the perfectionist to kind of balance it out in the middle. Um, that's absolutely brilliant. Now, one of the things that I found, I'm sure you have too, actually, is that in our industry of our small community, I mean, there's all these different certifications that seem to have a similar type of people, but all different flags that they carry. But of all these different people who think about the body differently in fitness <laughs> land, marketing themselves and getting clients and getting busy is something I've seen a huge, like a really, really big struggle with. And there are not too many people. I mean, I don't want to talk about age, but you're someone that's been doing this for a while and you've made a career at this and you don't, I mean, you've built it, you've designed everything, you've curated your own clients, you were nomadically everywhere. Now you're at a place. What kind of hurdles have you had to overcome with marketing and advertising what you do with this weird biomechanical, mechanical therapy, personal training thing. Yeah. So it, it, it's interesting. So I, it, again, there's, there's a lot of pieces to that because, you know, one, I, I'm kind of one of those people that I always talk to everybody, right. I'm anywhere I am, you know, I'm on an elevator. I, I, I was laughing because I, you know, we, we were doing a, we were teaching a workshop in, in New York and I was with Grainy and, and we get, we go into this building and we get in the elevator. And as soon as the elevator door shuts, I look at the guy next to me and I'm like, how's it going? And he just like looks at me like, what's, why are you talking to me? You know? And Granny's like elbowing me and he's like, don't, don't, don't. And I'm like, what? Like, like in Pittsburgh, that's what we do. When the elevator door closes, everybody starts talking to each other. You know, in New York, it's like everybody just shuts up and you're like, what the hell? Why is nobody talking to anybody? It's, you know, that, so I just talk to people all the time and I, you know, I find out something about them and how I can relate to them. It's all about relationships. And we've talked about this, I think, before where everything's about a relationship. And, <clears throat> when I was teaching workshops, um, you know, I was traveling all over the country and, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to have, you know, some, some of the bigger companies promoting some of that for me, but you know, it, it the kind of the peak of it, a lot of it was, it was people would re were requesting me, um, and, and not necessarily whatever, but I'm, wasn't it better than other people. I just, I think I was just personable. I was talking to people and, and then there would be somebody in a class that was a fitness director at a club in a different city. And they just heard about this. So then they would be like, well, I want you to come teach it because I know what you do. You know? And so then I get invited all these different places. So, and then, of course, as you teach that way and you get known through the communities, then, you know, people have clients that they have clients with a cousin or a sister in Pittsburgh. Right. So then I get calls from them. And then all the people I work on, it's all word of mouth. Like I have so many families I work on. Like I have, you know, because I work on the, the mom and then the then the dad comes and then the daughter comes and then the you know, cousin comes and it, you know, and it just, you know, so a lot of it's just word of mouth and, and, and we do very little advertising. Uh, it's, you know, we, you know, John does some social media stuff and all that, but it, I think in reality, I don't know that we get a lot of influx of people from that kind of thing. And the part of town we're in, is not like a walk-ins kind of area. You know, like we don't, we don't have a ton of walk-ins cause it's just not a, I mean, there's a coffee shop next door, um, which is nice. And the, you know, but there's, it's just not the, the, this part of town. It's a little bit like a little bit to one side, a little bit to the other side. They're they're built up, but we're kind of in an area where everything's growing towards us right now. So but there's not just a ton of traffic here. So we don't, you know, we're not in a place where you know people are walking by, see us, and pop in, and you know. But a lot of it's just word of mouth and in creating relationships with people, talking to them about what they need and what they want. They they get a good experience, and then they want to refer everybody they they know to us, you know, and. And, you know, that doesn't always work out, but people come one time and then they they don't come anymore because it's not their thing, but they refer friends of theirs. I mean, I get I'm getting referrals for people that I don't even know the name of the people who's referring them. I'm like, oh, OK, <laughs> I remember that person. 
<laughs> you know, but it's great. It's like, okay, I'll take it. And, uh, but then also teaching the workshops locally, you know, I've got a lot of massage therapists and acupuncturists and, and physical therapists and, and personal trainers, athletic trainers, where they're working with people and they, they refer, you know, they see, they had a good experience in the workshop and then they see that and come, they want to send people to me. And then I, I'll work on something and I send them back. And that's, I think this is the key too, is when people refer, you know, if it's a, if it's a, pre, a professional referral, you know, give them something that they can take back to their, uh, to their practitioner. Like, so give, you know, that client comes to you and you see a couple things going on and you, you figure out, you know, this, maybe they were missing this piece, let them know that, you know, but professionally and not, you know, not like, well, you missed this and that's why they're, you know, and then because everybody wants to keep that client, right. They want to be like, well, I want to work with that client now because I can fix them or I can get them better or whatever. It's like, no, that's their client. They refer them to you out, out of respect. You, you know, and, and I think that's a big thing. A lot of people, they, because they're trying to still build the business, but you got to give to get back. Right. So, you know, they come in, you help them out and you tell that person, Hey, this is, this is what I did. This seemed to work. Maybe you can reinforce that. And they appreciate that. You send them back to them. They're going to send more people to you. And uh, but when you when they come and then they stay at your place and you just start working with them and they leave the other person, they're like, well, what, why am I going to refer anybody to them? They're stealing all my clients. You know, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. so it's because I've seen that happen a lot of times, you know, and it's just not, you know, number one, it's not professional. Uh, number two, it's just it's not the right thing to do, you know, and if the person makes a decision to come to you instead of them, that's one thing, but you know. Well, so. speaking of professional, I mean, you definitely have an extensive list. I'm looking at my list over here. I mean, you went to school for psych, you did criminology, engineering, you've been cutting up humans, you got your MS exercise science, you were uh, martial arts, you worked at a wellness center, personal trainer, worked at a prison, teaching at a university, cadavers, and you worked with some pretty cool celebrities, like maybe I George St. Pierre, <laughs> and maybe a few other people. <laughs> How the heck do those kind yeah. of things happen? Is that just from your infectious personality? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, some of it were, uh, I mean, it, there's, there's been a lot of different ways that happened just from referrals from people. Um, I've worked with, uh, you know, some hockey players, some football players, some, you know, some pretty big names in uh, baseball. And, you know, of course, uh, I, I was working with a, a huge portion of the Pirates at one point when they, you know, they, I don't know if anybody knows anything about Pittsburgh sports, but the Pirates are like a, a it's just like, oh man, what's going on here for the past <laughs> 30 years? And, um, but it was really funny because the, the, uh, there was a two year period where, um, there were some players that I was working with pretty extensively and they had two really good runs. They, they didn't make it to the playoffs, but they made the wild card game both time, both years. And, um, and I always, you know, always want to say like, you know, you, you'd like to take credit for it, but I mean, those guys were, they're hard workers, man. They did it. They did a really good job and they were a cohesive team. And, um, but they, when I worked on a couple of them, they just kept referring more players to me. So then I pretty soon I was working with like half the starters, you know, and, um, or actually more than, more than that. And, um, and then, you know, then of course they know other athletes in different areas and, you know, they refer people. And then when, so I have a lot of athletes when they come into Pittsburgh to play, you know, one of our teams, uh, here, they'll come and see me before the game and shh, don't tell anybody because all the, all the Pittsburgh fans are going to get mad at me for helping the other team out. But. <laughs> we just won't say any names. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, then I, I was uh, blessed with the opportunity to be able to work with uh, George St. Pierre right before, as he was training for his uh, middleweight championship fight. And um, it was, it was pretty sweet. He, uh, uh, he was great. I mean, he was flying me up all over the place. I got to watch him train with uh, Freddie Roach at Wildcard Gym out in LA. Um, he flew up to New York to work on him a few times and then uh, up to Montreal where he's from uh, when he was training there closer to the fight. And um, and then I got to be, he, I, I worked on him the day of the fight um, and he had a little room that he had rented out for treatment stuff and uh, I worked on him the day of the fight. And and it was kind of funny because the one of the things we were working on was his, his shoulder stability um, for doing the rear naked choke, which is the hold that he put Bisping out with. <laughs> so it was pretty sweet. It was, uh, it was, it's pretty awesome. So if you work in any of the pirates and things don't go well, we're not going to talk about it. But if you work on the rear naked choke hold and it takes somebody out, that's okay. <laughs> that's yeah. incredible. So, I mean, yeah. I, I have a million questions, but I mean, the number one I'd like to ask is, I mean, for someone 
like George, like not for him particularly, but he's someone that quite literally could get anybody to show up and come work on him. And I imagine that it could be quite an intimidating experience having someone of that caliper athlete, uh, that notoriety um, to, to work on. And I would just love to know, like, how did I mean, how did you go about doing that to try to build the rapport, the trust? Or was it kind of like uh, he hired you as a mechanic and he was just there and you did your thing and he just trusted you knew what you were doing? Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit of both. I mean, he I came pretty highly recommended, you know, or else I obviously probably wouldn't have gone with me. And so he uh, when I came in there, it was the first time I saw him, we were in L.A. And so he flew me out to L.A. He was training with Freddie Roach. And um, and so I he came to the hotel room and I had my table set up and I just kind of evaluated his range of motions, looking at some things, asked him what, if anything was bothering him or anything just felt you know, what, how do you think about it? We kind of looked at a couple of things, worked on some things. And then the next day I got to watch him uh, hit mitts with Freddie Roach. I always watch how he moved. I was, you know, watching his footwork and watching his, his trunk movements, his shoulder movements, all that kind of stuff. And just seeing, you know, what happened and, uh, you know, kind of talked to him a little bit about how he felt. I think it's just kind of getting comfortable with, with how he moves, you know, cause he's, he's, uh, I mean, he moves very, obviously very smoothly. He wouldn't, you know, be where he would, but, but he, you know, it's not, he's, some of his moves are a little bit different than, you know, just watching normal people move. Right. So, you know, just kind of looking at the little, the tiny little differences between his, his left to right and, and where, you know, where it looks like he, he might be uh, kind of hold himself back and then talking to him about where he has like stiffness or discomfort or, you know, things like that. And we just kind of work through all that. And, you know, within a, you know, a couple of times working on him out there, he, he felt pretty good. He felt solid. And so then, you know, I think, I think that can help establish that, you know, that rapport, you know, cause it, like I said, you know, you come highly, you know, recommended anyway, he's going to give me the benefit of the doubt, I think from the beginning, but then you go after that, you got to earn it, you know? You do good work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. And so that's kind of what happened. We, we worked with him. He felt pretty good. Um, he, we improved his range in a couple of things. Like his trunk rotation was really limited to one side and we, we kind of locked that in and got him really solid there and he was turning really well and it, his power was increased. So when he was, when he used to hit mitts again, he was like, Oh my gosh, I can really dig through this, this foot now and just drive harder. And so he could, he could feel the power change in his, in his striking when he did it, which was, you know, that was all, I think all it took. <clears throat> and, you know, luckily I've been involved in the martial arts and boxing world for, you know, most of my life. I mean, I started martial arts when I was eight years old. So, um, you know, I boxed going and fought golden gloves for, you know, about six plus years, you know, so it was, you know, martial arts competitions and everything. So I've been around that for a long time. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> and, and you so did a bodybuilding to show people. too. I did. <laughs> I'm going to look for I pictures. Did. I'm going to see if I can find some pictures to share. <laughs> I did a powerlifting meet. I don't have pictures from that oh, one. That was before team. Dude, you've yeah. done so much. Okay. So I did, yeah. honestly, I, I was a cheerleader. For college. Cheerleader. <laughs> What are, is there anything else we're missing? I feel like there's going to be like one more big obscure thing that we're missing. Cheerleader, bodybuilder, powerlifter, boxer, martial artist, worked in a jail. What else we got? <laughs> all, kind, all kinds of stuff. Well, amazing. Hunting, fishing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that George stuff, I mean, and not even just George, but I mean, you as a professional, I mean, you've obviously made, like, like I told you off camera, like you've been one of the most... I mean, off recording, one of the most popular people that we've put up that we we're going to do for this podcast, which I'm really excited about to cool to see, because to me, I mean, for me, you were a mentor and you really helped me not only as an educator, think about things differently and understand the RTS world. I learned a lot from Peter, but see it through your lens. But you also helped guide me to become an instructor and a better communicator. And you've been doing that for so many people for so long. Um, I mean, honestly, in my opinion, it's a shame that more people don't get to see you teaching because I think that you're one of the most right now because you're one of the best instructors that I've ever seen. And I'm excited to see what Joe D does next because honestly, you're a rock star, man. You're a nomadic rock star in Pittsburgh and you got to get out there. You got to get away from those mines and you got to get in front of people. Yeah, no, I I, um, I, I have some pretty cool plans of, of beefing up the anatomy program Uh here in Pittsburgh specifically, and, you know, kind of trying to promote it uh, a little bigger. <clears throat> and well, a couple of things kind of, kind of, and actually I actually have one coming up. I have a, a anatomy workshop coming up in November. So uh, that should be pretty sweet. Awesome. Man. And, uh, and details. we'll put it below here for sure. Yeah, for, for sure. 
And um, but yeah, I think the big thing I remember I had a student ask me one time um, I was teaching a workshop and I was I was just being straight out there and and just given all the information. Right. And and the person came up to me and he was on a break, but it was towards the end of the workshop. And they said, you know, aren't you afraid that like if you teach somebody all this stuff that they're going to, you know, they're going to surpass you or, you know, be, and I'm like, I, I hope they do, <laughs> you know, I'm like, and I hope, I, you know, but, but I said, they're, they're going to have to work really hard because I'm always continuing my education and learning more and progressing the way I'm thinking and progressing the way I'm teaching and progressing, you know, what I, you know, looking at the different research and new research and old research. And, and so it's, it's funny because I, that was a really bizarre thing I thought when they said that. And then I was like, no, like, I, I hope the goodness, you know, like when, when the, the student becomes the teacher, that's the greatest part of, of a teacher's career. If you're, if you, if you've got the right mindset, because <laughs> then they've, they've succeeded. And, you know, I, I think it's awesome. Yeah. There's a, an analogy that I learned when I was playing drums more, and it definitely relates to us is that in my opinion, as an, a teacher or a leader, if you will, you should give everything you possibly can, because even if you give everything, it's going to be up to the student to take, like you just said, take it all and apply it. But if you're doing a good yeah. job and they're doing a good job, they should look at you even after they learn everything and be like, why is Joe still so far ahead? And it's just because even <laughs> though they progressed on the timeline, you kept progressing on the timeline yeah. and you kept going. And so it's not that you are just inherently smarter. It's just you keep exploring more and more and as they are. And if you're doing it concurrently, you'll always or they might catch up. But I hope they do catch yeah. up because honestly, that's the thing is it yeah. shouldn't be just, you know, the Joe D's and the Tom Purvises and whomever else. It really should be as many people that can learn as much about this crazy, weird body thing, helping as many people as they can, which I'm excited to see your anatomy stuff. And whenever you want to come to Toronto, I mean, I know I got a small hole in the new market compared to the Toronto Athletic Club. But if you ever want to come up here, man, we always got space for you. Oh, I appreciate it, man. I love it. I love it. I still get your shirt, man. I, I, uh, I uh, wore it last week, I think. So <laughs> we I wear, still prove Everybody's like, who's that? I said, well, you, you, it's my buddy. We got you. <laughs> Dude, I, I threw out a ton of shirts, but of like the five I kept, the move integrated one I kept because it's it's actually like the coolest shirt. I, I still, I don't even know how you guys did it. I mean, it's got like sewn two colors, three colors on the arm. It's got scripture on the back, text on the front. Like I want another one. It's the coolest looking shirt. It doesn't even matter what it's about. It's just like the best. Yeah, the, John. John does all the the merch stuff, and he does a phenomenal job with it every time. And it, it never ceases to amaze me. I'm always like, "How did you like? You nailed it again." <laughs> That's good. Well, Joe, man, listen. I think we should put a pin in it today. I, I just wanted to say again, thank you so much for being open to coming on, doing this live thing. Um, thank you so Absolutely. much for being an amazing mentor and leader in this industry. I mean, if anyone's listening to this now, live or in the future, you have to check out Joe DeAntonis. Check out Move Integrated Physical Culture. I mean, you got some amazing stuff coming out, and people need to hear what you have to say in your delivery because you can help change some careers. Maybe they even become work in a jail, or go work at a university, or go work at a. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. One of those, one of those crazy. I worked in a marina too. I don't know, man. <laughs> cool. Well, Joe, thank you so much for everything, man. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you as soon as we can, as soon as this uh, virus lets up a little bit and we can connect. I'm really oh, excited. Yeah. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad to see you're healthy and, and uh, thanks for you having me on here. I appreciate it. And uh, this, it's been great and it's just always great talking to you, man. It's always great talking. Thanks so much, man. All right, dude. We'll talk to you soon. Hi, right, Brandon. Take care, man.